Hello, psychologies. So looking forward to talking to you all about virtual meetings and how we really start to own our confidence, we start to own our energy, and we start to overcome the horrible Zoom fatigue and the horrible feelings of imposter syndrome that we have when we have to speak on video conference. Hello, as you join, it's nice to see you, Joanna, Tatiana. Really good to see friendly faces. I'm Caroline Goida. I've been a voice coach for many, many years. I worked for a long time at Central School of Speech and Drama, and I've written three books, which amazes me. And I, I did a TED Talk a few years back, which has had nearly 8 million views, which also feels slightly insane. And my expertise is really this thing about finding our voices, partly because I struggled so long as an actor and then also as a voice teacher to find my voice and my confidence. And so everything I teach is really stuff I've had to learn the hard way. And I want to share with you some stuff that I have had to learn the hard way in the last six months to help us on video conference. Now, it's worth saying that you are, you know, the friends, readers of psychologies. You know already quite a lot about how we harness mind, body, breath. I'm going to talk a bit about the voice and how we start to bring that into the equation. It's worth saying that psychologies who I love are brilliant and if anybody um, looks in the link at the top of this they will send you a free copy of psychologies which is really marvelous so do use that because it's such a fab magazine and so much of what psychologies teaches is about this harnessing of mind and body and breath and the thing I love about voice is that voice is the expression of mind body and breath because voice is exhaled air. We just don't think about it very much. And we should, because really now we are in the land, aren't we, of video conference. And we're gonna be in that land probably for at least a year, right? I think that's realistic. So I really believe that all of us need to Oh, Joanna, you're asking me, where is the link? Oh, the link is at the, if you go to Linktree at the top of the psychologist's profile, they will find it. Also, you can direct message them on this. Do ask questions, by the way. I will keep an eye on questions. But back to video conferences. Oh, gosh. I remember back in March, I, I sat there and I thought, OK, so all my speaker gigs have gone. And suddenly, everything is webinars. And I remember I started doing webinars sitting down. And it felt, I don't know if anybody else is doing video conferences sitting down in a home office, I felt so lacking in power and energy, and I felt really unconfident. And I started to suffer three things that I bet everybody else is suffering too. I started to suffer Zoom fatigue or WebEx fatigue or, you know, blue jeans fatigue, whatever platform you're using, my voice was getting tired. The second thing that started to happen was I started to really get a sense of imposter syndrome because I wasn't, normally I speak on a stage, right? Or I go into some posh boardroom and coach someone, but this was happening from my house. So my kitchen table was also the place that I did webinars from and it just didn't work for me. So these things, Zoom fatigue, the feeling of Zoom jail, of being locked into our houses and not being able to escape, and also the imposter syndrome that comes of really this work-home life collision that I think is really difficult for people. We're going to think in this session about how you really overcome those things. So if you are struggling with video conference, please put questions in the chat. Now, first rule, so I have to hand a lot of this learning to Henley Business School, so shout out to Henley Business School, because I was running a session for them at the time, way back in March, when everything got cancelled, and they said, we've been teaching online for years, and our lecturers have some really good tips for teaching online. The first thing they would say, which someone has already put in the chat, which I love, is stand up. They said our lecturers find that if they stand up, they have more energy, they have more connection, they have more power. Now this, right, was a massive game changer for me. And in fact, if you just remember one thing, stand up the next time you have a scary video conference. I just went off and bought a laptop stand 
And I suddenly found that what was making me feel imposter syndrome and nervous suddenly felt, I felt much more confident. I felt like my old self. And so that, that was a big game changer, the stand up thing. If you want to ace a video conference, try standing. The reason it works so well is that we breathe better when we stand. We have a natural alignment that supports the voice traveling on the outbreath to go out of the body. The other reason that standing up when you do a video conference is really helpful is because you can use your hands. Now the funny thing is that we're often taught not to use our hands or we're taught to use them in a little box on screen. But there was some research recently that showed that when we use our hands, our voices have so much more music, so much more energy. And when you stand, you've just got more access to that. So first thing, thank you Henley Business School, stand up, I promise you, it works like a dream. The second thing they said, which was really also a big game changer for me, was segment your content. They said, we find that we can't teach as much content online, we can't communicate as much content, because audience attention is so much more distracted. And in fact, Forbes, if you Google Forbes, they did a survey that said that 75 people say that they are more distracted in video conferences. So the fact is that your audience, you're competing with email, Slack, you know, WhatsApp, their kids, their, their partner, the dog, someone knocking at the door with a delivery. You, you are suddenly competing on video conference with all of that stuff. So you've got to be really short and punchy and segmented. And the best way to think about it is actually broadcast. Because when you watch a TV show, it's really tightly timed. There are really focused sections of content. And that's what works on video conference as well. So whatever you were going to say in a live session or a live meeting, cut it right down. Cut it down to probably half or a third of what you would say. And then really find a way to make the delivery concise and punchy. So the first rule from Henley Business School was stand up. The second rule was segment and keep your content concise. And the third rule, which I love and I've used so much ever since, was to really engage your audience from the off. Because I bet that all of you have had the experience of doing a video conference and really not being able to read the Zoom or the, you know, the, the video conference room. Partly because people might have their cameras off, which might be a good question to talk about, but also because you've got less information. In a real room, you can feel people's energy. You get a sense of the meta messages of how they're sitting, how they're breathing. Much, much harder to do through a screen. And so what I was taught early on, way back in March, when I was learning this new medium, is get them involved in the chat right from the off. So if you have a chat function in your virtual meetings, use it. Get people in the beginning to tell you where they are. You know, talk to people, say, right, can I get everybody to put in the chat where you are today? And suddenly you have a conversation going. Or ask people to say how they're feeling. Or you might ask people to ask a question. And by the way, I'm Caroline Goida, for those just joining, we are talking video conferences, how to deal with Zoom fatigue, how to deal with imposter syndrome. So do please put questions in the chat. And it's lovely to see Debbie Templeton's smiley face there. <laughs> so this thing about if you want to ace a video conference, really engage your audience right from the beginning, right from the moment you dial in, start chatting, ask for questions, respond to questions, and suddenly it feels like a conversation. What I've loved over the last few weeks is people saying to me, I really enjoyed that webinar, it felt like being in the room with you. And I, re I really believe we are stuck here for the next six months to a year, the more we can really connect with people through the screen, the more we can really start to make it feel like a conversation, the more we're going to have fun at work, right? And I think often with video conference, we feel like, oh, God, second best. I wish I could be in the room. Let's not, let's not think like that. Let's think about really working with the medium. And Tatiana, I like what you said. 
So true. And as an audience member, I, I like engaging. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in we have to go first. And I think often we feel vulnerable, we feel highly visible on screen, but the more you can really set yourself up and the more you can really engage with an audience, go first, the more you'll get engagement back. Now do, let's, I'm gonna scroll back through, do feel free to ask questions about video conferences. Does anybody have a question that they would like to ask? Because if not, what I'm going to do is talk through some questions that I really frequently get. And one of the questions I get a lot is the question about our voices. Because people are talking to me about having a tired voice on Zoom, this Zoom fatigue thing. People are often saying that they feel low energy. They're saying they don't know how to project energy on Zoom or whatever platform you're using. And what I would say to that is, You've got to talk through the screen, not at the screen. So I'll show you what talking at the screen looks like. So I imagine I'm writing my emails. I tip my head forward. I breathe in my upper chest and I talk to the screen. Just send my voice to you. Now that's kind of natural in a way, but it's not giving you enough energy. If I just align my posture, if I imagine I have a book on my head, if I, I'm very near Clapham Common, if I look out the window and I identify a tree that I want to send my voice to, but I keep looking at you, if I then talk to you and send my voice to that tree over there, then suddenly my voice is much more energized and I feel more energetic than if I'm at this level talking to you like this. I have literally spent the last six months saying to people, stand up, project your voice to the tree over there and take your time. And if you just do those three things for your voice, you will feel so much more in control and you will sound much more energized. And God, we all need energy right now, don't we? Because this is we're in a tough time. So we need to really radiate good energy and not become a drain when we speak on video conference. So that's the, that's the voice thing. The next thing I think we really need to do is be empathetic. So I think not seeing each other, well, we see each other all the time, but we don't connect, we don't hug, we don't shake hands. We feel less connected. If you can really put yourself in the shoes of your audience before you get on the call, you will have this natural connected empathy that will really cut through the screen. And one of the things I do, and, and psychology's listeners, you will know this exercise, I suspect, those of you who do any coaching, is that there's a meta positioning in NLP, which is where we really take time to step into the shoes of the audience. So I'm spending time with clients now saying, what are your intentions for this meeting? What do you want to achieve? And then I'm asking them to go and stand in the position before the meeting of the person they're talking to. And really put themselves in their shoes, in their job, in what they are hoping for, what they're fearing, what they're valuing. And when we do that, before we get on a call, it gives us this really easy, connected empathy. And it also is a really good tip for confidence because the, it's weird I have to admit on Instagram live it's very weird staring at yourself talking <laughs> and so that can make us it happens on video conference as well and that can make us feel really self-conscious but if we've stepped into the audience's shoes beforehand if we really know how we are serving them because we've thought about what they need it kind of dissolves that self-consciousness. So the more we are in that sense of empathy, the more we cut through the screen. So get that posture, stand up well, really think about audience, really segment your content, keep it short, keep it pithy. And then the next thing is novelty. So something that I am noticing is that people are hiding. They're hiding in two ways. They're turning their cameras off and they're hiding behind their slides. Hands up if anybody has noticed that, right? And I think increasingly people are hiding because it feels exhausting. 
So the first thing I would say about that, the hiding, is you don't have to do everything on camera. In the old days, we had meetings that were face-to-face, -face, right, in a boardroom or a meeting room or a coffee bar, because we wanted to see and connect with someone. And then we had meetings that were on the phone. We had a conversation, we couldn't see them. It's fine in these days of video conference to have some meetings where you don't see each other. And you might even want to brief people in advance that this meeting is just audio. You don't need cameras on. Oh my God, the introverts will thank you for that. And then when you do have the camera on, you can really embrace it. So there's something that Brené Brown says about boundaries. She says the most impressive people, the kindest, most generous people are usually the most boundaried. And I would kind of tip, tilt that to say the most engaging people on video conference are also the most boundaried in that they know when to say no to video conference. They know when it's better just to have a phone call. Because if you have boundaries, you can have energy. So there's the camera on, camera off thing. There's also the slides thing. So often when we have video conferences at work, we, we have a deck and we hide behind it and it gets really boring. I'm sure we've all got over, overkill on slides. So what I would say is if you have a deck, just click in and out of it. Don't use it all the time. Because actually the thing that's going to compel people, especially if you're selling, especially if you're, you have any kind of new business, you're trying to persuade, turn off the deck, be there, be visible, connect. Because what that's going to do is allow people to see you, to make the connections. So camera on when you need it and then turn off the slides. Now do feel free to ask questions if you have any. I know that a lot of people are asking me at the moment about how you deal with um, really understanding what's going on for people. Because often people will sit in silence and they won't connect. So one of the things I'm learning is that it's really important to connect before a call. So if you have a meeting with people, I'm, I'm writing at the moment a, a program, a course on meetings. And so I'm really thinking about this. By the way, if you want a course on meetings, just sign up at my website, which is carolinegoida.com, or you can just send us a direct message on my Instagram. But as you investigate the idea of virtual meetings, you realize there's loads of pressure, isn't there, on, on the moment of the meeting. And what we don't have anymore is this ability to walk to the canteen with people or to meet someone in a coffee bar and chat about our families beforehand. We don't have the opportunity to walk back with them after the meeting. So there's all this pressure suddenly on this moment of connection and it's too much pressure. What we really need to do is just ease the pressure a little bit. So I'm using lots of surveys before meetings, or I'm asking, I'm having a quick phone chat with people to find out what they want. It's like we have to kind of prime attention, prime engagement. If you really want to engage a video conference audience, don't just think about the call itself. Think about what you can put in the meeting name that's going to engage them. Think about the questions you ask people before the meeting. Maybe send out a survey, find out what people want, find out what's important to them. And then when you turn up at the meeting, you know what people want, you know what people are asking for. And then after the meeting, give them something to listen to. Send them a podcast. Give them something, a, a visually good-looking PDF that they can take away with a summary. Give them a question to explore so that we start to stretch out the time of the engagement. We start to allow people to really reflect on what we're talking to. And that extended engagement is much more like what we would have had in a face-to-face -face meeting world, which feels like it's a long time away and it feels like it's not coming back immediately. I'm just going to keep an eye on time. I am going to start to sum things up. Oh, look, this, yes, the tree tip, Tatiana, that's lovely. The tree tip really helps you understand the difference between volume and projection. I love the idea, actors talk about the idea of projection. And I heard a, a, a lovely actress called Jenny Agata told me way back when I, were, I wrote a book about... Um, 
A-list actors and confidence back in God, 2008. And Jenny Agutter is a wonderful actor and she told me that she was taught years ago, very much to your point, Tatiana, that um, projection is really ascending of a thought. And she said, what I was taught to do is imagine that I'm talking to someone at the back of the theatre and I really want to send a thought to them. Because we naturally, if we're walking across a station and we see a friend, we naturally know how to send our voices to them. It's very easy. And so absolutely, if you have that sense of where you want to send a thought to and you're standing and you're breathing in a nice centred way, then it's going to travel really easily. It's not about being loud, as you're pointing out, Tatiana. It's about having a sense of where you're sending your voice so that you use the muscles low down, the intercostal muscles, the core muscles. You, you use the support muscles of the shoulders and the back to hold you up, and all of that projects your voice. The thing is, we know how to do that when we stand on a stage, most of us. We have a sense of that. But when we're in our home offices, when we're slumped over our chairs, because we've had 40 emails and too many Slack messages and we're feeling low on caffeine, then we lose all of that. And if you lose that energy on video conference, and I'm doing it now, if you start to talk here, feel how quickly your energy drops. So it's really important if we're going to energise an audience, Oh, that we need to ground ourselves, that we need to get our energy in the right place, and that we need to have a sense of where we're sending that energy through the screen, not at the screen. Oh, it's nice to see your professional presence. Yes, and Tatiana, yeah, I'm doing you're such great tips here. You're doing more physical props than digital slides. Really, really good point. The, the purpose of slides is, is really... It's to bring content alive visually, isn't it? And in a meeting room, that's important. But on a screen, in fact, in a meeting room, why not have a great prop? When I did my TEDx, I had just these really funky wooden props that someone called George McCallum had made. And it was so much fun to talk with those props. And I think it brought the ideas alive so much better than having a deck which everybody sees every day all the time. Oh, any tips on using physical props on camera? Great question. It's funny, when I, when I did that TEDx, I actually, sounds a bit extreme, I worked with a movement teacher because they are so good at helping you to know how to move with a prop. I think what I would say is if it's a really important video conference, if it's something that you really need to land, maybe it's you're speaking at a virtual conference, Get someone to help you with it. It could be a friend. It could be someone you work with. Think of a prop that really brings your message to vivid life and that feels really fun to play with. I tell you who's really good at using props is Lucy Griffiths. So do check her out on Instagram as well because she uses props in a really fun way. And then play with the prop. You know, it sounds funny. I'm all about rehearsal, really. But I would put myself on camera on my phone and I would practice... I would film myself and I would play with the prop and I would see how it looked. You can do that on Zoom as well, can't you? You could film your own meeting. You don't have to invite anybody to the first one. So test them out. Make them um, really exciting and fun to you and make them something that you will enjoy playing with. I hope that helps, Tatiana. I think props, I think props are the way forward, really, because... The, it's novelty. So if we start to sum up, I hated doing this kind of medium. I hated video conference when I started out back in March. I was taught by Henley Business School, stand up, really good tip, segment your content, keep it short, engage the audience right from the off. Get them involved in the chat, get them chatting to you, because that will make you feel more confident, it will make them more engaged. Then there's something about empathy, really put yourself in the audience's shoes, cut through the screen, project your voice, use your energy, and if you need to, if you want to bring the content alive, use props. So I really hope those tips are helpful to you. If anybody wants to add any more questions, anything else that you think you want to explore, go for it. 
But I think that if you are happy with that, we're going to be doing another one of these in a month's time. And we're going to talk about how you really tell stories in public speaking, how you feel really authentic as a speaker when you communicate. But if there's anything anybody wants to know right now about video conferences, do please feel free to ask. Yes, intentional props, that's a good point. If not, I am going to wrap up and let you all go back to your lives. Thank you so much for joining. I'm just scrolling through the chat. In a nutshell, what I want to say as we finish is start to really own the medium of video conference rather than feeling like it's something that is hard and difficult and not as good as meetings. Start to really play with it. Up your energy, up your connection, play with props, ditch the deck, and you'll start to really feel like this medium can be yours it can be playful, it can be enjoyable, and you will start to notice your audience is really, really engaged. Really enjoy doing that. Psychologies is such a great magazine to be helping you with this because it's helping you really connect the mind, the body, and the breath. And remember that when you connect mind, body, and breath, that's when your voice, your authentic voice really kicks in. If you want more tips like this, firstly, sign up to the psychologies link remember they are going to send you a free magazine when you do that which is just brilliant go for it and you can also sign up on my insta or feel free to sign up on my website carolinegoida.com because we're about to send out messages about this new meetings course that we're doing online it's been so fun to work with you all thank you for questions i loved the questions about props because they are the future see you very soon see you in a month's time